everybody and welcome back to the Chan Chan. In today's video we are going to be discussing Kevin Smith's Netflix series He-Man. Oh no 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 it's called Masters of the Universe Revelation. Not Revelations, Revelation. Now in this video there's going to be lots of spoilers up ahead. There's going to be my likes, my dislikes regarding this. We're probably going to go episode by episode. Um, so if you haven't seen the series and you don't want anything to be spoiled please do not watch this video. Now I watched this thing all in one sitting. I uh, know it's not really impressive considering there's only five episodes, about 25 minutes a piece. Um, so it's essentially like two hours or so. So it's not really an incredible feat, you know, watching this thing in one sitting. It's like watching a movie. Now, Kevin Smith told He-Man fans that basically this series was, you know, for them, for the fans, that they'd love it. And there was so much excitement behind this series that I think, you know, it came with very high expectations. It currently has a Rotten Tomatoes audience score of about 30%. And this series has created a big uproar in the Motu community. Motu meaning Masters of the Universe, um, if you're unaware. The big woot woot here and general consensus from everything I've seen and read regarding this series is that the entire show focused on Tila, but not just normal Tila, like bitchy attitude, butch Tila. And He-Man fans are pretty outraged regarding that. It's like having a She-Ra cartoon, you know, that's obviously centered around a female lead She-Ra and then her stepping aside and, you know, Bo, you know, the kind of secondary uh, male character takes center stage and it's the Bo show now. Or, you know, something like Sailor Moon and, you know, it's all Sailor Moon focused, but then it's like, oh no, it's all about Tuxedo Mask. You know, so that, that's kind of what happened here. The majority of He-Man fans are mature men. They are men over the age of 30, over the age of 40, that's who the main fan base is. It's not kids, it's not females, it's those men. That's the target. I really think that Kevin Smith did mislead fans a lot. I think most of the fans thought that this was gonna be, you know, those, the swashbuckling adventures of He-Man versus wisecracking Skeletor, but it was not. It was all based around Tila and a version of Tila that those that demographic audience is probably not going to enjoy. So I think it'd be fun to just, you know, start from episode one, go to episode five. I'll do a quick little recap of each episode while giving my commentary in between there as well. So in episode one, Skeletor finally breaks into Castle Grayskull and it turns out Castle Grayskull was just an illusion to hide the fact it really housed the Hall of Wisdom. Inside is a magical forest where Mossman lives he gets killed. And there's also with this magic orb that Skeletor wants to crack to get the secrets of Eternia and Grayskull. I really love this. I love that Skeletor, you know, was finally getting what he wanted throughout that whole original He-Man series. He just wanted to get in Grayskull. He wanted to get the secrets of uh, Grayskull. And the whole time, you know, as I was watching, you know, that old series back in the day, I'm like, okay, Skeletor, when you get in there, like, what are you going to do? You know, so this this series actually kind of answers some questions for me. It's like, okay, okay, I see what's going on here. There's like some like little orb thing going on in here. You want that, I got it. So it kind of answered some questions for me, which I appreciated. And I like how this was all happening in episode one. It got me hooked. I was like, holy shoot, Skeletor is going for it right now. But when Skeletor cracks that darn orb, it creates a powerful blast that will destroy the entire universe. I guess he didn't know it would do that. So I, I, I guess he didn't really know what he was doing when he got into Grayskull. He-Man then volunteers to sacrifice himself and contain the blast himself, therefore saving everyone. The power sword splits into two pieces. And during this time, Tila finally discovers that He-Man is actually her best friend, Prince Adam, meaning her best friend and close friends around her kept this secret from her for years. Prince Adam ultimately dies and it looks like Skeletor has disappeared as well. Man at Arms is banished from the kingdom by King Randor for knowing that his son was actually He-Man and not protecting Prince Adam. So after this first episode, I really enjoyed it. I liked how Skeletor, you know, finally accomplished what he wanted to do. But at the same time, I was quite um, disappointed because it's not what Skeletor really wanted to do. I guess he didn't know he wasn't supposed to crack that orb. He was supposed to do something else, as we'll see, you know, in the later episodes. But um, so I was like, oh, sweet. We're going to see what finally happens after the fact when Skeletor does all this stuff. But it's like a curveball that wasn't supposed to happen. So it's like kind of going off tangent now. Um, and I really like kind of how He-Man actually died in the first episode. I thought it was a bold move. I was intrigued. I was like, what's going to happen now? In episode two, things start to get a little weird. Tila gets a new haircut and clearly has been working out. She's definitely got a chip on her shoulder, has this bitchy attitude and hates magic. She has a girlfriend named Andra who is a skilled engineer and it kind of feels like 
with more than just friends, if you know what I'm saying. I'm intrigued. I like change. I like new experiences. It was interesting to see this new kind of progression. Again, not what anyone's expecting, but I found it very interesting. In terms of uh, Andra, I feel like her character actually should have been a male character, but not just a male character, like a humanoid creature of sorts that had like maybe a cool beast head, you know, it's like this beast creature. I feel like that character replacement could have balanced out the genders a little bit. And uh, not that we have to balance genders out, but I mean, like they were really kind of forcing the girl power and it felt a little forced and unnatural at times. Tila from the original 80s Masters of the Universe that, you know, millions of people grew up with, millions of uh, girls and boys, um, they watched Hila. She was a, a character that was established. You know, her sexual identity and her sexual preference, you know, were not necessarily uh, established in that cartoon. It wasn't really a big deal back then. You know, everything was so flamboyant and everything back in the day. It was really fun and campy, that cartoon at times. But they just made it such a big deal, like in a magnifying glass, like, oh, look, Tila's got lesbian undertones and stuff. And I just, I feel like it's kind of forced. Okay, so back to episode two. So Tila and her friend take a job from this mysterious lady who is clearly Evil Lynn, uh, to go get the chalice from Snake Mountain, from Snake Mountain. Uh, there, Tila and Andra discover that Triclops, Triclops, that Triclops is the head of a new cult who worship technology and worships something called the Motherboard. I really like how this new evil power rose up to Snake Mountain. You know, with Skeletor being gone, there still is, you know, an opposing force to the forces of good. So it turns out that cup, I think, was actually the Havoc Staff, and Evil Lynn brought it back to the Sorceress and Cringer who are in Crassel Grayskull to help strengthen the last bit of magic left in Eternia. We learn that Eternia was born from magic with the power sword binding magic to Eternia. And with the sword gone, no more magic, and Eternia will die as well as the rest of the universe. So good and evil must now work together to find the two halves of the power sword, one piece in Subternia, the land of the dead, and one in Preternia or heaven, and call on the power of Grayskull to bring magic back. So we have a goal now. We got to find those two halves of the power sword, good and evil working together. That's pretty cool to see. And I'm really looking forward to visiting Subternia, this kind of land of the dead or this hellscape. In episode three, we have the Spice Girls. I mean, Tila, Andra, and Evil Lynn, who bump into Man-at-Arms and Beastman. And they ask Man-at-Arms, or Duncan, his name is, uh, if he can forge together the two halves of the power sword. Man-at-Arms refuses because he feels he failed Adam and is still banished from the kingdom and wants to respect the royal family. I thought that was kind of a lame excuse. I mean, you have the opportunity to save the entire universe and your dear Eternia and royal family that you love so much and, you know, make things somewhat right again. But no. Here we also find Orko, who is very sick because magic is dwindling away, and Roboto is here too. Because Roboto actually has Duncan's memories inside of him, Roboto can forge the sword back together, so he will go in Man-at-Arms' place. As the crew sails to find the first half of the sword, Merman is captured by the group, and he leads them to Subternia's entrance. In episode four, we get to Subternia, where the terrain plays tricks on the group and separates them. Evelyn and Orko start to forge an unlikely bond as they battle a large beast, and Beastman, Andra, and Roboto work together to defeat some zombies, while Tila makes a bargain with Scareglow to feed him her greatest fear in exchange for a sword half. So Tila gets to show us her greatest fear in this hellscape, this subternia land of the dead, and it's He-Man. And so I guess she's afraid of, you know, being uh, outpowered or defeated by a man, or maybe she's scared He-Man doesn't like her. I don't know. I thought it was kind of lame. I'd say this was probably my least favorite episode because I was actually looking forward to this episode and to going into the land of the dead. Uh, and I got really disappointed. But it was really cool to see Scareglow. He actually wasn't used in the original He-Man series. He originated from one of the comic books and they made a toy of him, but he wasn't actually used, you know, in the cartoon series. Um, so it was really cool to kind of pay homage to Scareglow and see him there, you know, in the land of the dead. But the whole land of the dead area was very, very lame sauce. I wanted to see some tortured souls, you know, some horrid creatures and some, some tension, but instead it was a pack of lame zombies, a, a monster and a pretend He-Man. Then Tila all of a sudden is like, no, Scareglow, I will not give you my greatest fear because I am strong. But you know what? I'm taking that sword half anyways. Bye-bye. 
Tornius. So a portal is then opened up to Preternia, and Orko sacrifices himself to Scareglow to let the rest of the group through. And finally, episode five, the last episode in part one. We get to Preternia and find Prince Adam there. It's sort of awkward that no one is really excited to see Adam. Tila's just like, I'm still mad at you. Turns out Preternia is a sort of Valhalla. There have been many champions of Greyskull in the past to protect its secrets. And when one of them dies, they get to go to this paradise of Preternia as a reward. It was really interesting to see the original He-Man Eternia playset in Preternia as like this palace that's a very, very rare playset. So it was really cool to see that there. And I really did like the concept of, you know, multiple champions throughout history um, protecting Greyskull. And, uh, you know, if they die, they go to this Valhalla place. Um, but there was also like Mossman was there and there was also a sorceress there it looked like so I guess maybe anyone associated with protecting Grayskull is you know a champion I guess. So all the previous champions uh, in Preternia here are in their champion buff form except for He-Man who has chosen to remain as his lesser self of Prince Adam. I thought it was really interesting that He-Man chose to be his lesser self. There's a few reasons I can think of of why he chose that form. And I was looking forward to him actually explaining why he chose that, but I don't think he ever did. It was also very cool to see um, a Conan the Barbarian-like draft of He-Man that was actually first conceptualized way back when it was like the first sketch of He-Man. Um, and as well, there was the Wonder Bread uh, promo He-Man, also known as the Savage He-Man or Wondar. So I thought those were really neat Easter eggs in there for fans of He-Man. It was really cool to see this Skull character who was the first champion of Eternia. That was pretty awesome. I really like his character look too. Um, and I, I thought it was quite convenient how there's all of a sudden he he's like, oh yeah, there's a portal to Eternia in my room here. So I thought that was like a little too convenient. And it was really neat to see Hero. He was actually originally a concept wizard character who was to be a part of a Eternia's past. Um, so they added him in the series, which was pretty cool. And he gives the group the other half of the power sword. Roboto dies from the power, you know, required to forge the sword together. And Adam chooses to go back to Eternia with the gang to live again. But by doing so, when he dies, he's gonna lose his spot in Preternia. So now back in Eternia, Adam says, by the power of Grayskull, and magic is once again brought back. But just when everything is going well, you know, Adam is just about to transform into He-Man, Skeletor, who has been hiding in Evil Lynn's staff all along, comes out and stabs Prince Adam. Skeletor invites Evil Lynn to stand by his side, and Skeletor takes the power sword and yells, By the power of Grayskull, I have the power! and he turns into what I'm gonna call Champion Skeletor. Whoa, Skeletor finally did it. You know, he thought he did it in episode one, you know, by cracking that little orb thingy, but he didn't really understand what he was supposed to do. So I guess he finally did it in episode five. He did it right. He was just supposed to grab the sword. He was say, by the power of Grayskull, I have the power but you should have done in episode one. So some things that I really enjoyed about this cartoon were all the Easter eggs and homages, you know, to the original series um, and for fans to kind of find, you know, be it play sets, character concepts, characters that, you know, weren't used enough and cool characters that the community really enjoys but were heavily underused. Um, and examples of that are, you know, like Hero, Scareglow, um, even like the Wonder Bread He-Man, that was pretty cool. And another thing I noticed at the very beginning of the series, um, kind of in the prologue, I guess, they used a bunch of graphics that were actually from original He-Man advertisements and art. He-Man was known for having very elaborate, nice packaging art. And so it was cool to see some of some familiar paintings and pictures um, at the beginning. I also really enjoyed the music throughout the series and uh, the animation style was really beautiful. But considering who the main and true demographic of this series is, I know that the majority of fans were probably very disappointed by this series. Um, I think fans were misled into thinking, you know, it was uh, He-Man versus Wisecracking Skeletor brought into this new age. I thought they were really excited to see that, but it, it was all centered around Tila and not really a form of Tila that was very appetizing um, and intriguing to this demographic. If the show was originally titled, you know, 
Tila, Revelation, Tila, The Continuing Adventures, or Tila, I Have the Power. I feel like fans would have kind of, you know, known what to expect, and I think that the series would have gotten way more positive reviews. But me personally, I was like, oh, interesting, interesting. Appreciated the Easter eggs, thought it was an interesting perspective on Tila, felt a little forced girl power at times, and kind of like hidden LGBTQ undertones and stuff that really felt forced. Not that it's a bad thing, it just felt very forced in a character that was already established, you know, back in the 80s. It's kind of weird changing that. If I was in charge of doing this series, I personally would have done He-Man versus Skeletor and I would have made it gory. I would have made it brutal. Think Castlevania, think Ninja Scroll, think Berserk. I would have brought He-Man to the new age. Skeletor, the jokester gone insane. He's gone mad. He's like the Joker. Ahaha, uh -huh -huh. Mark Hamill did the Joker voice. Now Mark Hamill's doing Skeletor voice. Um, but I, I definitely would have, you know, brought it to that new age. Who's the demographic? Is it kids? Is it females? No, it's mature men. Bring it to the new age. Gory, bloody, cool, sword and sorcery, mystical, legendary. Make it awesome, make it cool. So let me know your comments on this series in the comments down below. I'd love to read some of them, get your general consensus down there, get your opinion. I'd love to know how you think you could have made this better and what problems you had with this series and what things you enjoyed about the series. So leave me those in the comments down below. Let's get talking. So please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I come out with new videos every week. Come check me out on social media and help support the channel on Patreon. So thank you all so much for watching and stay legendary.